Well, welcome to Life Talk. We are so glad that you have joined us this evening. We have a special treat for you because we're putting the emphasis this evening on our missions team. And we'll get back to our regular uh, discussions, discussion-based small group Bible study that we do online that we call Life Talk uh, next week. So since this is pre-recorded, full disclosure here, pre-recorded, because if our guests from Europe were meeting us live, they'd probably be up in some really awful hour in the middle of the night to do this. But anyway, so we're doing a record, but we still want your comments. We want your uh, your feedback. And uh, typically, as you know, we probably when we do this live, we can bring those up in real time. We don't have that opportunity, but we hope that you'll enjoy it. By the way, our previous mission guests, uh, we've archived all those videos on our, uh, on our church uh, website, calvarywb.com. You just click the link that's on the main page that says missions team, and, and you can go back and review those. So uh, let me just bring in our all of our panel for tonight, including our guests, okay? Ah, uh, so very good. Of course, Lisa, you know, Lisa, doing all right? Doing great, doing great, so thanks. You're there in the kids' celebration room. I am. And uh, Joe's down in his uh, uh, well, well-stocked with books office. <laughs> uh, right, good to be here and I'm up here in and what we what we affectionately call Studio A here in the church. So this is where we do our online service from. So you probably, actually th with this camera, it's a little wider back background. You can actually see that that cross and Bible picture there. You only catch the corner of it normally on Sundays. And coming to us all the way from France is John and Judy Hatcher. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be with you. Well, good. So just just so I think the most efficient way to do this time wise is why don't you just take a little bit and introduce yourselves and give us some background. And then we are we are loaded for bear with questions. We never seem to run out of questions, but we want to just have a great discussion with you, get to know you a little bit better. And hopefully at the very least, come out of this know, knowing how we can pray for you a little more effectively and a little more strategically. So so uh, welcome. Go ahead. Just share a little bit about uh, about yourselves. You want to go first? OK. Okay. I'm Judy Hatcher. I grew up in uh, South Shore, Kentucky, not too far from West Virginia or, or Huntington. Uh, that was a big trip for us to, you Char know. Charleston. Oh, you're in Charleston. Sorry. We're <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 not far away. That's all right. Not that far. <laughs> well, I, I, I pastored a church in Portsmouth, Ohio, which is Joe Moore right above me's hometown, which is just across the uh, the river from Portsmouth. Right. So. We could look over uh, from our second floor of our house over into Kentucky and the South Shore in that area. And, and uh, there's hillbillies there, just like there are in West Virginia. I know that. <laughs> yeah, for there are. <laughs> Go ahead, Judy. I didn't mean to interrupt My you. My parents were uh, real involved in church. And so I grew up in, in First Baptist in South Shore and and uh, heard, the, heard the gospel and was saved uh, at a young age. I was 10. Met John when I was Oh, probably about 16, I guess, 17. But we started dating when I went to uni uh, University of Kentucky. And uh, we met at my sister's house. And um, and then, uh, long story short, <laughs> six weeks after we were married, we went to Brazil for a year and a half to, to help, um, or basically to take care of John's parents' work while they came back to the States on furlough, which was my first introduction into... Uh, <laughs> Life in the fast lane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was fast then too. And then we came back to Evan. Uh, we were back in the states for 25 years in Evansville, Indiana, where our four children were born, and and we were part of a wonderful church family there. And then the Lord uh, spoke to our hearts, and 20 years later, here we are in France. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As you see, we still get a little bit emotional when we think about God calling us here. Uh, I was born uh, way, 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 a long way from Charleston, actually, over close to St. Louis, Alton, Illinois, which was uh, a sort of industrial town back after the war. And, and uh, if you're old enough, you remember Alton Boxboard. Everything in America was shipping Alton Boxboard. Uh, and uh, now that company has been bought out by two or three companies. And, and uh, anyway, uh, when I was two and a half years old, my parents moved to Brazil as missionaries right in the middle of the jungle, the city of Manaus, which at that time was a dying city. I uh, did not have electric lights. And um, so, but growing up, it was great. Uh, and uh, had some option to be in the front line. My parents were very interested in us um, uh, being involved with people. So we always studied at home, 
but we also went to a regular schools with Brazilians. And uh, my parents really wanted to be integrated. They thought that was really, really important. And um, so even now when I, you know, yeah. meet Brazilians, they think I'm from Brazil because my Portuguese sounds like somebody from Northern Brazil. And mm. uh, so uh, uh, then I, I, I asked the Lord if you want me to do anything like be a pastor or missionary, God did not speak. So I went to school to be a doctor. And just when things were looking great, uh, I, I suddenly I was in a prayer meeting at uh, a church in Ohio. Uh, it was just a big youth meeting and we were just praying. Nobody was making an appeal for anything. And it's just like God spoke straight to my heart. Uh, I, I, I want you to, uh, to uh, serve me and, and share the gospel with people and so forth. And uh, it, it was a really, um, it was tough for me because I mean, my, my schooling to be a doctor was going well. And, uh, but now in retrospect, uh, I, I worked with that for a few, few months. And finally, a friend of mine said, Hey, why don't you just say, Lord, okay, if that's what you want, I'll do it. I did. God gave me perfect peace and just, uh, and, and in a retrospect, and I realized that God leads our lives to prepare us for, um, what he has in the future. So God is always using us in the present as his children, um, and he is preparing for the future. I, I forgot to mention that I, I trusted Christ as Savior uh, just before I turned 10 years old. Uh, actually, uh, after hearing the, the story of uh, um, David Livingston, and every afternoon between morning service and evening service, my mom would read Bible missionary stories to us, and she uh, was reading the story of Dave Livingston, who's the the nationalist from Africa, took his heart out, buried it under a tree in Africa, and died back to Michigan. And it was like I, the Lord had been working. I've been under conviction for several months, and I thought, "Whoa, what is somebody taking my heart out? What would happen to me?" <laughs> and and I just felt like I couldn't be saved. And I said, Mom, do you think I could ever be saved? I've been trying to look like a Christian, behave like a Christian. And I still know I had I felt like I had this thousand ton pack on my back of all my sins at the age of six. I started early. And, <laughs> and I said, Why do you think I can ever be saved? She says, well, honey, you, you can be saved right now. And so she just read to me John chapter three. And um, uh, she said, if you trust Christ right now, you have eternal life. And. I did, and it was the most wonderful thing in my life. Suddenly, the weight was gone. I was weeping for what Christ had done for me and laughing because it was so great. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it, it was just an amazing thing. So uh, at this next event, uh, you know, Lord it took it had taken me, I think the reason he did not speak to my heart directly about being a missionary or pastor early on was he took me to a public university and studying sciences I got to study sciences from people who are not God's children, but I saw God's creation written all over everything. Uh, especially, I, I had a sort of specialized in genetics, and uh, I just saw the hand of, of the creative God and all of that. I met people who were atheists, began to be able to have conversations with people who were atheists, had no idea what God was preparing us for. Then when we got through school, uh, my home church in Brazil, Call me and want me to come to work for them. So I went there, and in our first year of marriage, we we're married six weeks, as Judy mentioned. And I started passing two churches, was principal of a high school, a grade school, taught full time in the high school, taught full time in a seminary, and preached about 25 times a week. And we just got married. And uh, if I, I tell somebody, don't do that. Uh, wow. I, Judy was taking Portuguese lessons and she one day she said, honey, I cannot handle being by myself anymore. And about that time we had an English teacher quit in the high school and I said, well, come on, you're going to teach English. <laughs> <laughs> and the funniest thing, I'll tell you a little joke and, and, and then we'll move on. Uh, at that time, uh, uh, the series, the American television series, um, uh, Daniel, Boone. Huh? Daniel, Boone. Daniel Boone was shown on, on Brazilian TV. And when they found out that Judy was from Kentucky, they say, do you know Daniel Boone? <laughs> 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 so, 
So, but anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, at, at the end of that period of time, we really prayed, and I thought I was going to go on to to some seminary training. I'd, I'd kind of grown up in a seminary, and um, uh, the Lord really spoke to my heart that He wanted me to go and work and sort of help small churches get on their feet or start churches. And uh, right after that, uh, the church in Indiana, where my brother had pastored for three years, my brother resigned to go to the mission field, and they called. They sent me a telegram and wanted me to answer right away. Could I come and be their pastor? So we went there, and for 25 years, God really blessed us. We had wow. a passion for meeting, reaching people who were not churched. Uh, if people came from other churches in town, we usually wrote them a letter and uh, told them that we did not encourage people to join our church from other churches in town, that our passion was to reach unreached people. And the uh, Lord really helped us reach many, many, many people. Uh, we used, I noticed you have this uh, Bible, we, we used uh, inductive Bible studies uh, with friends and I, I could spend an hour talking about how it all got started, but but uh, God opened the door. And we were able at the time we left the church uh, had multiplied many times the size. Was, at that time, it was about 250 people, but 80% of those people that's the only church they'd ever been in. That's where they were saved and baptized. And uh, so, uh, those were wonderful years there, glorious years, and it's good to see those people still serving the Lord. And in the process, God was preparing us for something that we had no idea was going to happen. Uh, so I don't know if you want to ask questions now or want us to well, go. We'll, 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 we'll take a break and, and we'll get to the next chapter here in just a moment. Uh, hi, Adam. Adam has joined us. Uh, Adam is our hi, Adam. pastor. I know he's. Uh, you've been in contact with him getting getting this uh, set up. So, uh, so what we're going to do, we're going to take... Uh, uh, each of us is going to take we've got at least one question. We may have time for two questions. And since I'm already talking, I'm going to ask the first question. OK, maybe it'll be an easy segue into uh, where we're just going. But you're now in France. And uh, so, so talk, how did that transition take place? And give us a little bit of, of uh, overview of the ministry in, 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 that you're in in France right now. You want to tell how we got here? <laughs> Well, we, as we've said, we were in Evansville, Indiana, and and life was great. You know, we loved the church. The church loved us. You know, we couldn't we couldn't have asked for a better situation. But God allowed us to. Our, we came to Europe, and um, we didn't see Christ. Yeah. Mm. It was it was as if you know you see the big and it was they were there but it was just big empty buildings we, we've learned a lot hist historically while well, you know all that the the historical background of 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 uh, religion in, in Europe over the years but but the thing that we didn't see was we didn't see the evidences of uh, of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And God used that. Yeah. We, uh, uh, so yeah. So we we was I was in, in Europe one other time. Uh, well, actually three times. I went to Romania because at one point I thought God might be leading me there. Uh, and uh, Romania has many many more Christians than uh, than France. And I just felt like the believers there were doing a good job. They they were getting some help from missionaries for pastoral training and so forth. And uh, that was a few years earlier. Um, but through these events, and about that time, our churches started having a uh, an annual conference to encourage missions and every believer to see themselves as a reproducing child of God. Uh, and so um, uh, we encourage. You know, how can we grow in our faith? How can we share Christ with our friends, our neighbors, the people we work with? And um, uh, we called it our outreach conference. And we would have guest missionaries, too. And churches that were reaching people would ask them to come and share with us. Uh, and one lady, I, I, I want to tell the stories to sort of emphasize how God uses each of you as individuals, it's not just the big shots. It's not just the preachers and missionaries. Uh, God uses every one of his children. Every one of God's children are his children in light in this world. And um, so a lady in our church says, you know, this is a great book. We could maybe sort of use as a reference this year is called Operation World. And it talks about every country in the world 
and where they stand demographic. If you've never seen that book, I would encourage you to get it. It just started some mimograph sheets by a missionary, I think, in South Africa several decades ago. Uh, but in the book, uh, so we, we use this as a reference book. And so I started reading up on France and I was blown away because I assumed that France was much like Brazil, a Catholic country. I knew it was European, of course, but where people were generally, you know, believers in a religion, Christian in religion. But as it turned out, I found out that they're not. 50% of French people are atheists. In fact, almost everyone in the working class are. Uh, we, we have, we live in a house here and there's four houses around us. Uh, and uh, when, when we moved here, four, three of the four neighbors were atheists. They just come right front and tell you. Uh, and uh, the, what most people don't realize is that when the French Revolution took place, the Catholic Church was outlawed. It was a revolution against the Pope, the King and the Church. And mm -hmm. if you don't know about that, will help you understand a little bit because people get the idea sometimes that France is kind of like this Christian country that we had. Well, Christian was it was touched by the gospel almost two thousand years ago, shortly after the time of Paul. Uh, then it became a, dominantly controlled by by the uh, Roman Catholic Church, and uh, because of the continual changes, they started making these councils where they. Forbid, forbade the people to read uh, the Bible. In fact, one of those right here in the city of Toulouse, we're actually in the Tournefeuille, which is a neighboring city. Uh, and uh, the second oldest college of preachers, Sorbonne is the oldest university in France, and the one here in Toulouse is the second oldest, and it was started as a college of preachers to preach against the Cathars and all the sects that were against the true church. And, uh, and, and, what they saw as a true church. What they saw. What they saw as a true church. Yeah, it, you know the the, the Pope's church, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, they uh, basically outlawed lay people from reading the Bible. And uh, so when you come to French Revolution, one thing is if you read it, I love reading history. If you read the, our founding fathers in America, they were very concerned that America would become like France, an atheist country. I've already mentioned some of their writings back two hundred years ago over 200 years ago. And uh, so the revolution was against the whole system, the feudal system. And so they actually outlawed the church uh, the first six months. And uh, eventually after thousands and thousands and thousands of people were really killed and killed, mostly in the, uh, the uh, noble plan, uh, they, today, any church building built before 1905 is owned by the government, so all the all these cathedrals you see, like Notre Dame, that caught fire two or three years ago, uh, that's owned by the government. It's not owned by the people, and that's why uh, they do let the Catholic Church use them for masses. But you can go in there and, and you can tour around there. I've been to many of these churches. Turn around, there'll be a little group of people in a corner having a mass, and tourists are just walking around the building because they cannot keep the building from being used as a monument. And uh, so it's, it's, it's a very interesting system. So you have all these vestiges of uh, Catholicism, but, but people are not. Uh, the, the primary Catholic journal in France says that 1.8%, under 2% of people in France are practicing Catholic. So I give you a little picture of it. Uh, okay. Wow. So, oh, God related a passion in our heart to come here. I mean, he gave us such a burning passion, as you can see now, that we weep uh, because of, we just are share our Christ with people here. Wow. Very good. Well, we want to hear more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch it over and give someone else a chance. And uh, Lisa, do you, you have a, a question for uh, sure. John and Rudy you'd like to share? <laughs> sure, sure. Mine's going to be a little family related. Um, I was wondering, are any of your children serving with you in France? I know um, that, John, your whole family is a huge missionary family. So I was just wondering if it carried over to and you have children there with you. We have one son and his family that are here that are very, very, very involved. Philip, uh, he's our uh, second child. And he, as a young boy, felt that the Lord was called into to missions. He always felt, even from that point, that God was would use him as a tent maker missionary. And so he came to France about almost a year after we were here, two years. Okay. Two years after we were here 
and um, he and his wife and four daughters are are <laughs> very active missionaries. Yeah, they they are they are active in their in their relationships with people, and uh, they're very uh, involved. They uh, our daughter in law is a wonderful musician, and mm -hmm. and Philip is a musician, and so they and their daughters are very active in the that section of our, of our ministry and they they help they run the youth section and and uh, we participate we work together to have youth meetings with for teenage kids and and youth uh with the, the children's ministry amanda and i are, are really involved together so we have a great uh, relationship with them mm -hmm. our other we have one daughter that lives in, in uh, uh, Northern Kentucky, and she works at uh, Children's Hospital as a uh, nurse practitioner. And we have two children that are in Chicago that are involved in, in churches that they're a part of there. Great. Wow. Awesome. Okay, Joe, you're up. All right. So you were talking a little bit about how you're ministering to youth in your community. I also was reading on your website and understanding about the, as I understand that you do church in your home. Is that correct? Th that is correct. We're, we're, we're maybe, sitting in the temple right now. No. <laughs> man, there you go. <laughs> maybe you could tell me a little bit about that and how, how that, you know, I think, I think, first of all, I think it's neat that you're opening your home to do that, but I'd like to just understand a little bit more how that church is operating and how long you've been doing that. Okay. Well, we, when we moved into the neighborhood, uh, it just worked out. I, I won't give you all events that God gave us a place to live totally unexpectedly the first year we were here. <clears throat> and and uh, this is the, the fourth largest metropolitan area in France. We are directly south of uh, Paris, about 300 miles. And from our top bid, we have a, this is actually a fairly small house, but it has like a half story upstairs, which is where our bedroom is. And we can see the Pyrenees Mountains, which separate us from Spain. So in about an hour and a half drive, the most direct route we can take, we can be in Spain. Uh, this is where the Airbus is built. Uh, and they're Boeing's big competitor. Uh, I'm sure every one of you, has, if you've done much flying, you've flown on an Airbus plane somewhere. Yes. And um, so um, uh, we, had, we had no idea about that. We had no idea where God wanted us in France. We only knew one person who was a missionary in France at that time, uh, a fellow by the name of Richard Luger. And so we got, I had taught with his brother in a Bible college. And uh, so we got in contact and I said, what, what part of France needs the gospel the most? And he said, put up a map of France, throw a dart, wherever it hits, they're desperately in need. Mm -hmm. and, so, uh, but because they were sort of resettling to this area, we decided, well, we'd come here first. And it seemed an area that had no missionaries uh, at the time. And um, so we came here. They were in this area for a year or two. But God used them to get us here. And um, uh, so during the we wanted to go ahead and go to school. We had two or three options to go to school. We decided to go to uh, Alliance Francaise, which is like, it's like the French uh, language school. And they have most big cities have them, even a few big cities in the U.S. And uh, we wanted to take schooling where we would be living so we could also begin building relationships and get, get to know, be known in the community. And so uh, sure. in that time, we began praying where God warned us. And, and in the metropolitan area, we, we looked and there was a church that was started by a missionary um, in the 60s uh, in downtown Toulouse. We went there and they were running... Old, a little bit over a hundred at the time. Uh, off that, that church had started another church in town. Uh, and uh, so we went to that church. We, we loved the people. We started going there with every Sunday while we we're learning the language. And uh, about 80% of the people in that church were from Africa. Here's the thing that's interesting about France. There's only about three or 4,000 people. The total membership of Baptist churches in France is about three or 4,000 out of 70 million people. And, uh, I would say a good 75, 80% of the people are people from Africa who came to already saved. They migrated to France. So in that church, about 80% of the people were African, wonderful people, made good friends. There was a Vietnamese friend, people who had left after the war, 
fled Vietnam. Uh, they were from South, South Vietnam. Uh, there was a couple from Argentina uh, who came saved already. There was uh, a couple French families. And uh, so we, uh, what, and what we found, so anyway, that we build that relationship. And uh, so we looked then, and so this church, the, main, the first church here in this entire metropolitan area, and the second one were both in the city of Toulouse, which is a very large city. So we looked around. The third largest city was the city of Tuchnapui, which is where we live now. Uh, and uh, if you pronounce that, we give you an A for the talk. Uh, uh, <laughs> our daughter said, Dan, how come you move to the hardest place in France to pronounce? Uh, it, 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 so uh, anyway, the Lord led us here. We began praying and looking for a house and real estate. The house we live in is 115 square feet. The owners wanting to sell it after we've rented it for 21 years. The cost is $500,000. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And uh, it's the, the, the lot is probably about fifth of an acre, something like that. So I give you a little idea of the cost. So we realized early on that we would spend the rest of our time trying to raise money to build a building or we could hold her in a home. And we, here's what we sort of found out. When you invite people to your home in France, French people being good manners is really important in France. Okay. Good at the table and so forth. If you sure. invite people to your home, you better go. Uh, they better go, or they're, or you're not going to be their friend for long. I mean, it's sure. a really important thing. <clears throat> what we found out is, if you want people to come to some meeting, like a Bible study or something, invite them to your home. Uh, and uh, so, uh, anyway, that's how it works. So we, we meet, we just like a church. Uh, uh, Philip, our our son, and I, uh, we both are core leaders in the church. And now, now we have a third man who's turned out to be a, a, a good leader. We had three other who moved away. We've actually had three different congregations here. Wow. Because of the industry here, people come here to work, they get saved, and then they move off. So we have people now living in seven or eight different countries, including Western United States and various places, uh, who came to the Lord and got discipled here. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, we're missionaries awesome. in the world or something like that. That is awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Are you feeding? We face, we have them in our home. Our yeah. son has them in their home, yeah. or we have them in a park. Yeah. Um, we and use what we have. Yeah, and and we have. So what we did is when our son came, so we have sort of uh, uh, three levels of, of community. We have a single lady uh, who who who's came as a missionary, and her whole team that, that left the country, and so uh, she asked if she could work with us. We just met them. We met her here. And uh, so she's actually in the U.S. caring for, care for her parents right now. Her dad is really near death, wow. moving to heaven. But anyway, so she sort of has a single person. She has single meetings, has a lot of meetings with single people, friends she makes. Uh, all of our contacts are friends. Uh, at, we, in our street here, it's the U Street. We've had people come and get saved and disciples from seven different houses. On the U Street, it has 17 people. We go to the next block over, and there's three, three houses down there. And then friends bring friends. Uh, our granddaughters are great missionaries. Yeah. And so, oh, wow. and these couples are playing. If kids bring their friends from school, uh, our youth meeting is, is all, uh, we don't do any door to door stuff. They, 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 they are really anti anything like Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, right. And that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just like, right. so we found out early on. If you want to reach people, you better do it by building relationships. So we build relationships. They ask how people are here. Um, we, we we tell them that, uh, about what God's done in our life, and we would like people to have a better relationship to get to know God. And and if they get interested, we say, "Hey, would you like to know what Jesus really taught?" Uh, and we usually start reading. We have what we call inductive Bible studies. We can start reading through the Gospel of John with them. Let them ask questions. We lead, ask leading questions to get them to ask more questions. And you see in this little chapter here. And uh, we've seen people go from being atheists to being believers, you know? Wow. Wow. Very good. That's great. Uh, Thank you. Very good. Uh, Adam's up next. But before that, I, I want to just to bring this up. And uh, 
uh, if, and I, I assume that's the best place to go. Maybe if you have another website address that you want us to use or do it, but if you're watching, you want to get to know the Hatchers ministry and keep up to date, that's uh, good. you can use that uh, right there on the screen. Mm -hmm. And I'll leave that on for just a little bit. And we're uh, just a, in case you're joining us late, and that does happen on occasion. Uh, we're uh, with uh, John and Judy Hatcher joining us from France. They're part of our missions team. We're excited to be having this interview with them. And uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, it is, Mr. Adam's turn. So, Adam, I'm going to get you uh, up and in the in the number one slot. So go. <laughs> this one's a little bit more more personal, I, I, I guess, for me, and I mean for everybody else as well too. But I'm always fascinated um, with people in ministry. What um, what's helpful in your preparation time? Like what 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 people do you have a uh, conversation with about models or leadership or what books are you reading right now um, that pertain to your ministry or just building relationships with people? So if you could just tell me, hey, what you're reading besides the Bible, I'm, we, we all know that. But uh, what books or, or what, what conversations are you having with, with, with individuals that are pertaining to your ministry? Uh, One thing that helps us in, in broadening our view is is discussions with people when we were in the states uh in the past two years just meeting people talking with people our children uh, we have a lot of lively discussions <laughs> and so that helps us keep, helps keeps us current to what's going on in the world uh as far as books um I think we've probably read them all, haven't we? No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> we're, both, we're, both readers. we're both readers. I was trying to think of one that would be um... one book that really touched my life years ago, and I don't even know if it's in print anymore. It was called The Meta Church, and basically about a reproducing church. Um, and it was written probably a friend of mine uh, gave it to me maybe 35 years ago. Uh, here, here's the thing I found out. Many missionaries struggle when they go to the field. Now, every missionary we've gone has come, known that has come from America to France, has packed up and gone home. Wow. Here's the problem. Missionaries go to the field many times to do something that they have never done and never seen anybody else do. And that is cross over the bridge into another culture and reach people from un-Christian background. And so the difficulty is how do you do that? What I also found is there are good books and bad books. Here's what I would encourage anybody to do. If somebody seems to be reaching people, I'm not talking about, I know people who go to the field and round up people from some other missionary or some other work and round them up and they do work. I don't call that doing mission work. I call that rearranging shepherds. My wife's giving me a little elbow here. To, so, <laughs> so you don't want to read their book, okay? Another book you don't want to read is a guy who has interviewed a lot of missionaries maybe or, or, or has all these theories but has never done it. Here's what I encourage you to do. Find somebody, maybe somebody's unknown, who seems to be actually reaching people wow. to become the Christ uh, and, and trusting Christ, growing as disciples, and then those people in turn reaching other people. And you see somebody doing that, go and see how they do it. And here's what I have found is in the scriptures, as well as in the in the present world, God rarely uses the same method any time. Mm -hmm. God walks with us. We're on the road with Jesus. What does he want me to do? He wants me to pray and ask him for direction and wisdom. If you look at how Christ works, every interview Christ has with people, individuals, is a little different. He didn't use just one method. And and I I used a lot of methods. I was a go. I really wanted people to come to Christ. And uh, at one point at our church in Evansville, that was this was from the beginning of, of this. I, I read a lot of books and so forth. You, I won't mention some strategies we used, which I thought were good strategies. But at one point, I, I, I felt that I was pastoring a church that was full of kindergartners. We had a lot of people been saved, but and, and, and we were doing a ministry. Then it had we had a big, big outreach team, and, and I got them together. And I said, you know, that we've got a problem here. 
we're to be making disciples. And my understanding of the disciple is somebody who is following Jesus and therefore is able to reproduce other believers. Mm -hmm. So we're to human relation. And I say, so if if people can't figure out how to follow God's will, if people can't understand how to apply God's work to their life, if people can't understand how to communicate Christ with the people they know or the work in a team to work, you know, to use their giftness for God, I said, there's something with that picture. And I said, we're not making disciples. I said, everybody looks to me. They want to, what are we going to do next? And it may be great to be cheap. I said, but there's, there's something wrong with that picture. Christ is the head of the church, or supposed to be. And so I said, we're going to stop doing what we're doing, and we're going to pray. And uh, we prayed, prayed, and, and I won't go through the whole story because, because we don't have enough time. But God just led us into, for us, it works very well. Having building relationships, reaching people that were not in church, encouraging people to make friends with people who are not saved. Uh, and then uh, inviting them to participate in, in what's commonly called inductive Bible studies. At the time, I did not find many models. Uh, since then, I found a missionary in the Philippines that did it. Uh, and uh, But anyway, basically, don't, don't rush. Don't put people on the spot. Don't preach people in Bible studies. Uh, I came to Christ after hearing the gospel hundreds of times. So I was trying to give a 45 minute, very good presentation of the gospel, in my opinion, and the opinion of the people whose books I read. And then I'm at, you, know, you want to trust Christ, you know, and uh, I found out that's not the way God works in our life. Some people do. Some people trust Christ the first time they hear the gospel. But most of us didn't, did we? And so just presenting Christ, just living out his goodness, living out his love. What does it mean to really live out Christ? And so, so what we do is primary Bible says, so when we came here, we really, really prayed for God put us in a community. The first community we lived in, people were super, super, super unfriendly. And uh, so uh, when we moved to this community here, which was going to be our long-term place, uh, we prayed for God to open the door for us. And through a series of events, we moved in a couple of days before they had a big neighborhood party because everybody was moving from other places in the place. And uh, we got to know all of our neighbors in one night. They all asked, what are you doing here? Do you work for Airbus? No. What do you do here? We learned that missionaries, in their opinion, are only people who go to Africa to uh, help people who are poor. So we learned that's not a good word to use. So we said, well, we're Bible teachers. We, we want people to become acquainted with God. And, and he, he's been so good to us, we'd like for them to have a good relationship with God, too. Oh, so about three people asked that question. Question stopped coming. About half an hour later, this lady, later, this lady and boy, we had really been praying. Man, we had been weeping in prayer, asking God to open up doors. This lady walks up to me. She says, the other neighbor told me that you're a missionary. Uh, you're a Bible teacher. If you ever try to do Bible studies, I want to come to them. Wow. And this lady, was she talked about how she had grown up in a religious family when she was young. She had sort of become a non-believer because she had prayed to God in prayer. And, uh, but so we started having Bible study with her. Then through other contacts, we had three or four of these inductive Bible studies going on. And uh, at this point, we had language down pretty decently. And um, so we put her in different Bible study groups. They were just groups of three or four people. Uh, would you like to meet the other people that we have Bible studies with? And uh, they said, uh, yeah, that would be cool. So we said, well, you pick the time and the day that would be best for you. And we're going to try to get them, start having meetings with everybody together. Get this. Every single one, every single one. We thought we are going to have to sort of try to juggle plans. But this shows how God works. They said 11 o'clock Sunday morning. And the reason they chose that time, they said, is, you know, the weekend's kind of our downtime, time, time with family. And a lot of them had people in their family who weren't believers, who married somebody that's not a believer. Uh, they said, so we want to be done before they have sort of a late dinner, they late lunch on Sunday. And we want to be done before then, but we don't, we don't want, we want to sort of sleep in too, because, you know, we don't want to leave our family early. And so, Every single person put down, it looks like a word from God. I'm not saying 11 o'clock Sunday morning is a special time. I'm just saying the way God worked to bring those various vectors together. 
And uh, so everybody, we met the first time and it was great. And, you know, so it just kind of went on from there. So small group, uh, inductive Bible studies was primary for evangelism. Then we, there was, those just kind of turn into discipleship Bible studies. We help people learn how to apply God's word to their life. Uh, to read the Bible, we have men's groups, we have women's groups, and then we have prayer groups. Uh, and then, of course, uh, people had children, so we started having children's ministry. And those kids bring their friends to school. Then the kids got older, we started having uh, youth meetings, that kind of stuff. So uh, that's sort of how it developed. And it, it's a, it was a mixture of various things we learned from different people and different people. Very that's good. encouraging to hear. Thank you. Sorry, yeah. no, very informative. Uh, before we let you get away, get on to the rest of uh, your day, uh, uh, we really want to know how we can pray for you. And, uh, and uh, if you could just maybe give us some bullet points just so we can get them into our minds. And uh, John and Judy Hatcher come across their mind when we're praying for you as a church. What would you like us to be uh, uh, taken to the Lord for you? Um, I think one thing that would be uh, primary to us would be that God keep opening doors for us just to know people, to meet people, to uh, to interact, to have connection with with the, the neighbor next door, the neighbor down the street, the the people that we we met two years ago. You know, it's that ongoing thing of just being available and, and how for us to be available for people to, to uh, have those contacts and to just open new doors for, for people and to show us how it is that we can enter into people's lives. Right. There's a lot of people, you know, we live in a, in a town of 28,000 people and um, it's like you look around and you realize they, they don't know Christ. Yeah. You know, and the only way that they're going to get to know Christ is for someone to share it. Yeah. yeah. The number one thing is is new relationship. That is something we constantly do, and we've God has given us many different opportunities, different times, and I can just tell you story after story about how God has saved people through these contacts. But number one, is continuously we need to make new relationships. So out crossing people. The second thing is for God to stir people's hearts through our witness, for us to behave in a way toward them in kindness and love, to stir their hearts and ask questions. And that God will also bring events into their life. And that may be, you know, sometimes people find themselves in illness, some other need. Uh, it may be uh, worldwide event. But the God will stir these people's hearts. So give us, we continuously give us new relationships and stir the hearts of these people that they will have doubts about where they're headed, that they will have questions about what they don't know. Uh, and, yeah. And then the third thing is that God will give us the right moment to introduce the opportunity to start reading the gospel with them and sharing Christ. So th those are the three. Uh, and then that our believers will all keep growing and carrying Christ in the same way. Very good. And I, I like what you said. I'm, I'm just going to to rephrase this, but this is just good for not all of, for us to, to only pray about, but for everybody who is tuning in right now and watching for us to do this, to make new relationships, to make Christ known. That's how we, that's how, people get to know Christ is for us to engage in the culture, regardless if you're across the world watching this or you're in the same county or whatever else is to engage culture because we want people to know Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Yeah. And it, it's a little bit uncomfortable to do that, but I would encourage everybody at Mount Calvary and, and I encourage, I would encourage everybody to watch, come and watch your videos on your site. Cause I, I think they're great. Uh, I would encourage everybody watching this, ask God to help you see needy people around you and start making relationships with those people. Amen. Uh, yeah. Amen. Amen. Very good. Well, I tell you what, thank you so much for, for joining us. And uh, this is it's always delightful when you're talking to people that know the Lord, have a passion for Christ and 
uh, to know that God's work is bigger than what we see and it's in more places than we know. And, yes. and he is still building his church. Yeah. Right. And thank you so much. I want to thank Mount Calvary for your faithful support for many years now. Uh, I have good memories of every time I've been there. I've been there, I think, three times, have great memories. Uh, and it, it just it really encourages us to know that you're there. And when I got this contact to, to do this video, I was thrilled. I didn't know Adam, you know, I didn't know Adam from Adam. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, the support over these years is great, and we really appreciate your prayers. And feel free to contact the same time you would like. Yeah, and, very good. Very good. I, I'm going to ask uh, Adam if you could just uh, briefly lead us in a prayer for uh, for John and Judy, and and before we sign off. And uh, and I'm going to encourage all you watching make this uh, your prayer concern as we're praying, and also. I keep them on your prayer list going forward. So Adam, do you leave some prayer, please? Sure. Lord Jesus, we thank you. First and foremost, Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, for giving us life, Lord, for giving us eternity, for giving us the spirit of God to live out your promises in your truth that you are walking with us daily. Father, we thank you for technology that we are able to interact with our brothers and sisters across the world. Father, it is our prayer for all of us, not only here on screen, but for all of us who are tuning in right now, Lord, that we would just engage in culture, Lord, that we would make new relationships so that, Lord, that you would be known, that, Father, that people who come into a relationship with you, Lord, that they would no longer be sin bound, but Lord, they would be heaven bound, that Lord, they would have and know eternal life, that they would have life to the fullest because you are alive and well. In the name of amen. Jesus, amen. 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 Well, thank you so much. And thank you for joining us. Thank you, John and Judy. Lisa, appreciate it. Joe, Adam, thank you. Amen. And, uh, and uh, you know, we, we love our missions family. We love our missions team. And uh, we know this only heaven's going to record what, what God accomplishes through this faithful Amen. service. So let's, keep, let's keep serving him. Uh, good night, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Sure appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.